My name is David Thomas and I work for the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales. The Commission is based in Aberystwyth and since 2016 we've held the National Archive of the Aerial Photography of Wales. I've selected 20 pictures from that collection to illustrate how aerial photography has developed over the last century or so and what it can tell us about the places, landscapes and heritage of Wales. From the start I'd like to emphasise two things that I think make aerial photographs such an important resource. Firstly, they offer a unique perspective, which isn't available to those of us who can't fly. And secondly, they are very good at capturing moments, often fleeting in time. To illustrate the first point, here's an example from Lymore Park in Montgomery, where you can see lumps and bumps in the, in the fields from ground level, but they're very difficult to interpret. However, if you take to the air, you can make sense of them. The lumps and the bumps are the remains of the former medieval ridge and furrow of the open field system. And in the centre here is a flatter area, which is perhaps the remains of an abandoned medieval village. The second important thing is that aerial photography captures moments in time or specific events. This is a photograph of the site of the National Nationalized Stedford in Mould, taken in August 2007. The mice is there for a week or so, and then it goes. But here's, and here's a picture taken 18 months later, showing a now empty field although there are still slight traces of the hustle and bustle that had taken there 18 months previously. To tell the story of aerial photography, however, I'm going to start at the very, very beginning, and not in Wales, but in France, where the technique of aerial photography started. It's not surprising that aerial photography started in France. They were pioneers of both early photography and the flight, albeit separately. The combination, however, came together even before the invention of powered flight, because the first person to take an aerial photograph was this character, Nadar, who took his first photograph in 1858. He was a remarkable man, and amazingly, he was also the first man to take photographs underground when he photographed the catacombs under Paris. Nadar was a pseudonym. His real name was Gaspar Felix Tournachon. And here is one of his earliest photographs, taken from, the, from a basket under a hot air balloon. It shows the area around the Arc de Triomphe during the remodeling of the city by the architect Baron Haussmann. This is an image from the same perspective from Google Earth that shows how the area has developed since the 1850s. The British came to the party a little later, and this is one of the earliest aerial photographs in Britain. The subject is obvious, it's Stonehenge, but it was taken in 1908 before the restoration work of William Hawley in the 1920s. Note the wooden poles holding the stones up. And the photograph also demonstrates the unique relationship between aerial photography and archaeology, a subject that I'll speak more about later. Of course, the pioneering period of aerial photography came to an end with the advent of the First World War, and this saw the development of aerial photography for reconnaissance. Here's a photograph of the trenches near Richecourt taken in 1918. And it's from the First World War that our earliest photograph of Wales comes. And this is it, a photograph of the Mona airfield on Anglesey. There are no runways, and that's because at the time it was a base for airships. You can see a couple of them in the background, along with their massive hangars. The airships were stationed on Anglesey to watch the shipping lanes into Liverpool and spot U-boats operating in the Irish Sea. During the war, there was a vast improvement in the quality of aircraft and aerial photography. But when the war was over, there was a surplus of our aircraft, and rather than scrap them, they were sold at relatively low prices whoever wanted to buy them. One per person who bought one was Gilbert Graham Wright, and in 1919 he established the Aerofilms Company. The company, which survived the modified form until the 21st century, created a, vast, created a vast archive of photography, which we now hold in the archive of the Royal Commission. Here's an Aerofilms photography photograph of Aberystwyth taken on a summer's day in 1933, showing a lovely scene with vast amount of holidaymakers on the promenade, leisure, bro leisure boats drawn up on the beach, and obviously some kind of attraction going on here. By contrast, the photographs also document how important an industrial activity was to Wales at this period. Here's a picture of Llan Samlet during the, showing the impact of the heavy industry on the landscape and the environment. And this is a picture of the Guildhall Hall in Swansea, taken just a year after it was built in 1934. It, along with its gardens, is in pristine condition and almost sparkles in the sunlight. 
Of course, the peace of the interwar years was shattered by the outbreak of war, and once again, aerial photography became an important part of the war efforts on both sides. Here's a Luftwaffe view of Swansea, marked up with the strategic positions around the docks and city. The photograph is taken from a high altitude, but the next one was taken from a low level. It must have been taken by a very brave pilot prepared to fly that low over the anti-aircraft guns that would have been located around Swansea Dock. Or was it? It is exactly the same photograph from the Aerofilms collection in 1933, but it seems that at least some photographs were simply bought off the company by the Luftwaffe, presumably before the war. It's a good reminder about how strategically important aerial photography was. Of course, the impact on the war on Swansea was huge. Here's a photograph of Swansea from before, before the war, showing the dense urban settlement, a mixture of houses, offices and shops. In February 1941, there was a heavy air attack on the city, and the effect is obvious on this photograph, taken after the war, which shows how much of the city was destroyed. There are no buildings in the streets in the central area. The market has reopened in temporary accommodation, and the roof of the church has collapsed. The rebuilding of the 1950s is what created the city that we recognise now. After the upheaval of the war, the Aerofilms, the Aerofilms company went back to what they were doing before the world war, photographing places and events in Wales. This is one of my favourites. I'm a cricket player and a fan, and this is a picture of a packed St Helens cricket ground in Swansea, taken on the 7th of August 1950. The stadium is completely full, and we know that Glamorgan were playing against the West Indies touring side on that day. It was a famous cricket door, tour because for the first time the West Indies beat England. The West Indies team was full of some of the most famous players of the day, including the spinners Ramdin and Rant and Valentine, and the three W's, Worrell, Weeks and Walcott. The photograph is taken on the second day, when Glamorgan, the county champions at the time, were batting. The wicketkeeper is standing up to the stumps. The bowler looks like he's bowling right arm over, and there's a leg slip and a deep square leg in place. It's the classic field for a right-hand off-spin bowler, and the right-hand off-spin bowler in the West Indies team was the famous Sonny Ramadan, one of the famous, most famous cricketers of his day. So, a little bit of sporting history in this photograph. But the big development in the, in the immediate post-war period was the beginning of systematic aerial photography of the UK landscape. Again, like the First World War, there was a surplus of aircraft, and they were put to work by the RAF to create a record of the landscape. They flew in a series of straight lines, taking overlapping photographs that could be used to create a stereographic view that could be looked at in 3D. Here's Aberystwyth shown in overlapping photographs. Once again, these photographs picked up in de important details right across the country. Here's a view of Cardiff Bay with its famous docks. In the docks, they're breaking up ships, presumably ships that were surplus after the end of the war. This systematic survey of the landscape has created a huge archive, which we now hold. It fills a number of shelves in our archive, and it records every inch of the Welsh land landscape from the 1940s up until the 1990s. After the RAF finished its systematic survey, the baton was passed to the Ordnance Survey, and they began systematic flying for mapping purposes. This is a fairly late example, dating from 1987. It shows how they were marked up in the process of creating Ordnance Survey maps. But again, like the RAF photographs, they, particular, they captured particular moments in time. Here's a photograph of Travis Vanith Power Station under construction. If you'll zoom in, you'll see right at the centre, the core of the nuclear reactor. I said at the start of the talk, there was a very close relationship between aerial photography and archaeology. And one of the first to note this was the Ordnance Survey's first archaeologist, OGS Crawford. This is him with the Ordnance Survey's de Havilland Pussmoth. And he, and he was the first one to identify the phenomena known as crop marks. Basically, what happens is, when, is, when, is that when there is deep soil, the, the crops grow more strongly than the rest of the field when it dries out. This deep soil might represent, for example, a deep prehistoric ditch, which is part of an enclosure settlement. On the other hand, over former walls, the stonework causes the soil to be drier and therefore inhibits the crops, creating pale marks. This gives rise to some spectacular results. Here's a view of four crosses in Montgomeryshire. And you can see a ring ditch, probably the remains of a Bronze Age burial feature. If you, also, if you look carefully, you can also see rows of pits. 
presumably marking ancient field boundaries. This is an Iron Age enclosure to the east of Cardigan and one of my favourite crop mark sites with its double enclosure and elaborate gateway on the left. This kind of evidence doesn't last long. The day after this photograph had taken it might have rained and the crop marks would have disappeared. So once again the very temporary nature of what we're photographing is obvious. These conditions occur very infrequently. We've had a series of wet summers since, 2000, since the year 2000, but the exception was 2018 when the dry summer revealed a huge amount of archaeology that has changed our understanding of the past. It also created some stunning images. This is another Iron Age enclosure near Monkna Monknash in Glamorgan, showing up beautifully as a crop mark with its entrance on the left hand side and traces of an associated field system surrounding it. And this is a Roman villa. We know of very few Roman villas in Wales, so for, so for our aerial photography Toby, Toby Driver to get such a clear shot of this one was remarkable. You can even see the arrangements of rooms in the building. Of course, aerial photography is, is just now just one of the techniques that we use to record sites, and traditional aerial photography has been joined by new techniques. We started using drones to record individual sites in detail. Here's a drone in action, and here's the results of the work. The drone took a number of aerial photo photographs from different angles to create this picture of Dinas Dinclay near, near Carnarvon last year. And it's not just an image, it's an accurate 3D model that's being used to record the site and the effects of climate change by the team working on our Cherish project. We've even created a 3D printed version of this model. We also use LIDAR, which is a te technique that uses laser beams to model landscapes. Here's Puffin Island showing the topography and the remains of a farmstead. And to end, I'd like to conclude by, sh by showing you the suite of, of techniques that are available to archaeologists. This slide was also created for our Cherish project and shows the whole range of techniques from excavation, sediment analysis to remote sensing. By combining these techniques, we can find out far more about our past and how the people of Wales have lived over the, gen over the generations. If you want to find out more information about our work and our collections, you can visit our websites. The, our, our main website includes information about the 2018 discoveries, amongst a lot of other, inf other things. And on our Cobb Lane website, you can discover information about 100, over 100,000 archaeological and historical sites across Wales. Thank you very much.